You're listening to Females in Fantasy, a podcast elevating the voices of women authors of science fiction and fantasy who write about kick-ass heroines. I am your host, Brianna Da Silva, and this is episode one. And I am so excited to be recording the intro right now for the very first episode of my podcast. I have been wanting to do this for a long time and it's real. Um, so thank you for listening. <laughs> um, I am very excited to be sharing with you my conversation with Timmy O. Oh. Timmy O oh is the author of the upcoming science fiction book called Do You Dream of Terra 2? And she will explain all that herself. Um, she has a lot to say about science fiction as a genre in general. And also we get to hear her perspective as a black and British woman um, about representation and female characters and all that fun stuff. So I hope you enjoy our conversation. And without further ado, let's dive right in. All right. Welcome, Timmy, to the Females in Fantasy podcast. Uh, how are you doing today? Um, pretty good. You're all the way in, you said London time. Are you in, like, where are you exactly? Well, I live in London, um, sort of um, Battersea, actually near where the American embassy that Trump says is terrible um, oh, opens. Wow. So he personally insulted my area. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's where I live. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. What's what's it like there? Like right now? Like what's the what is the weather like? To ask a very boring uh, question. But. Well, I mean, it hasn't. It like it's sort of warming up a bit now. But okay. we, I, I know that it's freezing in America. Like yes. snow. We have no snow. Uh, we may never get snow again. Oh uh, yeah. Oh. Global warming. Yeah. I basically only remember snow in London when I was a child. Like three winters of it, and now it's kind of like. Eight degrees centigrade. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. I don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> but not very me. cold is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Literally here it was. So normally I would say in the Northern Virginia area, which is where I'm from, and I've lived here most of my life. Um, and it's, we usually have pretty, I mean, uh, some of our winters will be mild. Some of them will be kind of cold, but generally they're not too intense. But like we had a stretch for about a week where every single day it snowed and oh. it was like to like 10 degrees, which is so unusual here. And I was dying. No. <laughs> so I'm very glad that it's uh, gotten a little bit better. Um, <laughs> so um, let's turn to your book. Um, so you have a book that is coming out next year. Is that correct? Yep. 2019. Awesome. Could you tell us a little bit about it and um, like what your inspiration was to write it? Um, just like what led up to that being written? Yeah. So uh, I remember the first um, the sort of idea for it came to me when I was um, uh, I was watching this TV show called The Big C, uh, which is kind of it's like a drama that was on for a while about cancer. Um, and I remember one of the main characters saying that having cancer is like going to space, like being an astronaut, like th there's something that happens to you that sort of radically and kind of emotionally separates you from other people. And you see kind of, I guess, like another side of life, uh, which got me to thinking about being an astronaut. And I suppose the emotional aspect of it, the fact that you're completely alone most of the time, like on the ISS, they're the three people who aren't on earth. They're separated from billions of people. And um, so that was kind of how I got the idea for my story um, called Do You Dream of Terra 2, where there's another planet, um, which is it takes 23 years to travel to. And there's a sort of space race that goes on. And um, Britain wins this time. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're from like seven, seven British astronauts um, who travel to this other planet. But because it takes 23 years, they have to be young. So in my book, they're between 18 and 20. And so the book centers on their last day on Earth and their first year in space. And it's kind of like a coming of age novel set in space. And it's really just about... I guess like isolation because they're separated from everyone they know. But then also it's almost like a death because there are so many things they'll never experience. Like they're separated from their family forever. Um, there are all these places they know that they'll never go to on earth. And so there's kind of like grief, I guess, in one way, but also hope because they're founding another planet and they all have different ideas about how they're going to do it. This one, one of the characters thinks she's going to make like a utopia and, um, 
another character um, because it's set in 2012, which is like around the time that we had the London Olympics. Um, it's sort of like taken up in kind of patriotic fervor and decides that um, they're going to, it's going to be like a British empire, but like in space. Um, so, <laughs> um, so it's also kind of philosophical. It's, uh, I think there's an age that you reach when you're young where you start to think, what do I value and what, what am I going to pursue in life? What are, going, what are my priorities going to be? And it's sort of that, but on a larger scale, because their, their values will found a country. That's really cool. I'm, I am honestly really excited for that. <laughs> when I read the, <laughs> um, the description, I was like, this sounds really interesting. Um, I love how, I don't know, there's just so many things that you can explore with science fiction, especially, um, especially when we're talking about like going and colonizing other planets. Uh, it just, it gets, it's just, it really, it's really exciting to think about, especially because that, you know, is, is our future most like we're already, you know, on, on the way to, to doing things like that. So anyway, um, yeah, that sounds really, it sounds really interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, cool. It's <laughs> exciting. So tell us a little bit about your main character in the book. Um, so I have two main characters. Um, it's sort of, it's third person that's split through different point of views. Okay. Um, so there's Juno and Astrid, who are twins. Um, their parents are Kenyan, but they were born in London, uh, which is kind of like me. Well, my parents are Nigerian, but I was born in London. So I have kind of an experience of sort of being second generation. You sort of yeah. identify as British, but then you, you, your family are African. Mm -hmm. So they're both twins who were selected. Um, and in my story, you there's kind of like a space academy uh, they select 300 people um, at between the ages of 12 and 14. And they kind of go to a sort of like space, a really intense space school where all they do are exams and they have to like do physical training, everything that astronauts do, except that they're children, teenagers. Um, so they've also kind of been, it's kind of an isolating experience because you, you don't really get to grow up. And then they're also really, they, when they're selected for this mission, this colonization mission, they're also famous. So they're all sort of going through that. And then um, Juno believes that this is the chance that we have to found a new society. And she sort of looks at all the mistakes that were made on, on Earth. And in that like adolescent optimism type way is really sure that she'll do it better this time. She's kind of like, all the adults made a mistake. But this time, we're not going to have war. There'll be no famine. There'll be no inequality because we're going to do it right. Um, <laughs> so she sort of tries to impose this order on all the other characters while they're in, um, while they're on the spaceship. And it obviously goes wrong because she has her own rules and every, and no, no one has to agree, um, which, so she becomes sort of slightly disillusioned. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's Astrid, who's really idealistic. Um, there's a sort of religion that's, kind of come about during this time that they're growing up about this other planet. And there's a group of people called the new creationists who believe that maybe it's kind of like the garden of Eden, hmm. um, that a chosen few will go there and it will be perfect. So she, she doesn't really believe in rules. She kind of has a sort of religious idea about it. She dreams about it in the night. Um, and there's a famous astronomer who also dreamed about it. So she kind of feels connected to it. Hmm. Yeah. I suppose they, they sort of embody different ideas as twins. Like one of them is kind of like rationality uh, and the other one's more like faith. That, that's really interesting. <laughs> so would you say, um, I mean, you already mentioned like there was like that one way that you can kind of relate to those characters. Are there any other ways that you feel like you can relate to them or, or do you feel like your characters are totally different from you in terms of like personality and, and whatnot? Um, I don't know. I suppose Juno is maybe like an exaggerated version of my personal flaws. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I've been known to be, I, I, I've been told that I can be kind of bossy sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. And my mom told me when I was young that um, one of my friends came over when I was like five or six and I was like, welcome to my home. Here are the rules. And um, <laughs> I was like, you can't enter the home until you accept the rules. And like, that's sort of, she's kind of that character, but in her like early twenties, late teens. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then I suppose Astrid is maybe who I sort of hoped to be at the time I was writing it. I think I, I sort of, oh, uh, I think I, 
I was really stressed out about my future, I guess, because I was writing mm-hmm. it when I was in university and I didn't really know um, where I was going or uh, if I was going to be a writer or since I was studying science, if I'd be a scientist and everything felt really uncertain. And I think I really admired Astrid's certainty and her like sort of calm. She didn't need any, it, she just had faith that the future was going to be amazing, even though they were going into a far less certain future, like they're going to another planet. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk um, a bit more broadly about representation and things like that. Um, Quickly, though, for our listeners, um, some background. So Timmy and I were first connected over Twitter. Um, Actually, that is how Females in Fantasy started off. It started off as a uh, Twitter chat that has been um, continuing for the last Oh, it's been like almost a year actually that, um, that I've been doing it, which is kind of cool. Actually, by the time we're recording this right now in January, by the time this, um, uh, this episode goes live, I think it will have been about a year since I started, um, the Twitter chat. But basically, um, I put out a call because I think it was maybe in the summer. So I guess in August or September, maybe, um, where uh, I was looking for people to talk about like specific issues of representation on this this uh, monthly Twitter chat. And um, Timmy wanted to talk about um, Black female characters in fantasy, but I had already um, I already had too many people that were going to talk about that. So I was like, hey, why don't you come on my podcast that I'm going to start in a few months? So here's one question. What are some roles and traits um, that you would like to see more of for like Black characters in general in speculative fiction, but also like female black characters, if you have any like specific opinions on that? Well, I mean, I don't know if this is sort of like a wider, um, this is like a sort of niche view or not, (laughs) but I think I, I always, I always had the issue of like, um, well, I guess like the fact that I grew up in Britain, like, um, I was born here, my mum went to school here, but almost every time I saw representations, sort of like foreign representations of Britain, there weren't really black people involved mm. yeah and I actually remember I, I I think I had a whole sort of like personal identity issue which was that I only speak English my grandparents live in Britain in lots of ways I feel like I'm British except that I didn't see myself reflected in any way like in popular culture mm. but um yeah. that's really changed like since my adolescence I remember um during the London Olympics actually um I don't know if you ever saw the opening ceremony but um I don't know. <laughs> it was years ago. I mean, it was about like okay. by this point, it was like six years ago. But uh I remember okay. on TV, um well they sort of part of the opening ceremony, there was this narrative and um where someone like loses someone's number and they sort of run around and there's dancing. But the, the the narrative that sort of weaved through the whole ceremony was this girl who had this like giant afro and she was black. And I think what I loved that was that like they had the Queen, they had James Bond, they had J.K. Rowling, all of these people that they were really proud of part of Britain. And there was this main character and she was this black woman. And I just felt so accepted. I was like, it made me feel like I'm part of this country and people are happy I'm part of this country. And that meant a lot mm-hmm. to me. So in my book, I've kind of done the same thing. Um, I have these astronauts who were born in Britain and pretty much have like my experience um, of like, being British, but their parents are Nigerian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you were saying that I did. I just like, I just remembered. I, I do remember watching that opening ceremony. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> that was so long I, ago, but yeah. I don't know. I think everyone I know um, thought it was wonderful, but my mom uh, at the time she was living in Kenya. And I think everyone was really confused in Kenya is what she says. She was like, why was there the Beatles? Why were there nurses? Who's Harry Potter? And I was like, what? <laughs> What? Yeah, my mom sort of rejects everything that she sees as quaintly British, whereas I'm like, it belongs to us, the NHS. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I remember there was something about like teenagers. What was uh, it? was showing like different, oh, like different time periods of, um, of Britain. And then there was like, there was something about like, I don't remember. I, I just remember it was really like over the top. It was showing like these like teen, it was like this teenage apocalypse almost. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember what I'm talking about? Where it was like, um, I don't, I don't remember. I just remember it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Do you think that, um, like non-black or white, I guess, um, uh, authors, um, should write about black protagonists? And if so, 
when maybe should they or shouldn't they? I definitely think so. Um, I noticed this, I had um, like a friend of mine was, she's writing a novel and I was telling her well, basically about how, how much when you're represented, you feel like you're seen and you also feel like you're accepted. And, um, and she was like, oh, I never thought of that. I'm going to make my main character black. Is that okay? Can I do that? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. I, I definitely think so. I think, I, uh, I think a lot of people worry about this when it comes to say like writing other genders as well. And I think that the thing about writing the sort of magic of writing is that it involves this sort of like profound empathy to live inside someone else. And I think so long as you're like showing them as a complex character and they're not a stereotype. And I suppose with some people as well, maybe like getting sensitivity readers just to double check that you haven't perpetuated a negative stereotype. Um, but I think that that is the job of writers to try and empathize with all, all segments of like the population and all groups of people. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. <laughs> um, yeah. What are some negative stereotypes that come to mind um, that writers should be perhaps actively avoiding if they're writing about Black protagonists? I think Black protagonists that are only good at sports or singing can mm -hmm. sometimes be sort of offensive. Um, I really enjoyed this TV series, Dear White People. I don't know if you've seen it. No, I haven't. No, I should. Yeah, well, it sort of shows like um, Black characters in this sort of like minority. Uh, oh, well, they're in kind of an Ivy League university. Um, and what I really enjoyed about it was that it just shows that there isn't just one stereotype. There are like um, in this TV show, they have like black preppies and the black nerdy guy who loves Star Wars and then the black sportsman as well. And um, the mixed race sort of spoken word poet who's kind of a hippie. And I think just allowing all characters, like no matter what their race is or their gender, to be all of those things, just giving people, giving like that kind of freedom, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I need to watch that. I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I have like so many different TV shows that I've been meaning to watch. And um, I don't think that one is like officially on my list. So I should change that. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. I think especially because I don't know. Um, I, I remember reading somewhere. It was it was talking about this isn't sort of sci-fi in particular, but it's just sort of narratives. But it was saying it was talking about which um, movies often win the Oscars. And it was saying that like, I, I think it was the year that uh, it had that Martin Luther King one and, um, and he talked about precious and he was saying that the, the movies that win Oscars are either about like slaves or the civil rights movement or a black character overcoming like huge sort of social odds that are stacked against them. But then, she, but then he was like, look at the kids are all right. That's just about like a family just living their life. And he was saying that you don't really get that with black stories. You don't just have like the normal, I don't know, middle-class black people, just living their lives or it's always sort of like overcoming a kind of challenge, which is an important story to tell, but there are lots of stories. Uh, I don't know. Or he was talking about um, Silver Linings Playbook about two characters who meet each other and then like win a dance competition. So he, she was saying, well, what if we had that with black characters? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's so many, there's so many, like, I feel like there are often these assumptions that we have that are very, I mean, they're not conscious. I think, I think people do this subconsciously or you're just like repeating tropes, you know, that you see like in media or that you read in books and you just like kind of keep per perpetuating them. Um, and one is that there's a sense that like the like young straight white man <laughs> is like the default hero yeah. of like almost every single story. And then anything that's like any character that's different um, it feels like there has to be some sort of justification. Yeah, <laughs> as, if, like, there. as if like just because someone exists, like isn't justification enough for them to be, you know, the hero of of any story. Yeah, <laughs> um, and that's something that I, I feel like we really need to be like consciously fighting against. Um, well, it, fighting against in ourselves when we're writing stories, you know, like making sure that we're not like defaulting to that and like being more like. Like just there's just so many there's so many different there's so many different like intersections of life and of being <laughs> that exist for the human race and we really need to um like explore that more and yeah like you said like let people see themselves in those kind of roles like just normal 
normal, just normal stories, right? <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, especially because I feel like I had a pretty normal upbringing. I like, I don't feel like I over came tremendous odds or <laughs> anything like that. The stories that I'm attracted to are mainly sort of introspective, like coming of age type tales. But I think quite often it's told through like the gaze of a white man, like Catcher in the Rye or white women as well. But um, yeah, um, we, we all have those sort of personal struggles, those like personal, like philosophical struggles. And so I, I think I'd like it if um, that kind of literature reflected that as well. Another, another more broad question about science fiction, actually, kind of as a genre. What are some places that you personally see science fiction moving as a genre? Um, and then maybe where are some places that you would like to see it moving? I think I'm really excited by the fact that it seems to be becoming way more mainstream. I think science fiction and fantasy, like the fact that Game of Thrones is one of the most um, watched TV shows and The Handmaid's Tale as well, which is basically yeah. a sort of speculative fiction dystopia novel uh, that everyone's watching and won an award. Um, I'm also really enjoying the fact that, um, I don't know if you know about the Bailey's Prize for Fiction, the Women's Prize. No. I don't know if it's like a, I don't know if it's like a big deal in America or not <laughs> it's it's pretty big here so it's basically um a prize for women's fiction zadie smith won it um cool uh, a couple of years like ali smith is quite often um shortlisted um so it's sort of like literary fiction it's kind of like the booker prize but just for women in oh, okay um, yeah and um this year the power by naomi alderman won and she's that's kind of like a science fiction. And last year, A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers. Yes, yeah, that was yes. shortlisted oh, for it. And it's kind of... I haven't read that, but I want to. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a sort of like, it's a prize for what you might consider like sort of literary in quotes, like sort of mainstream. Yeah. Fiction. And um, the fact that a science fiction book won it this year is kind of amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I found it really exciting. Um when in like young adult fiction, you can have fantasy, like Harry Potter is technically a fantasy, uh, that's middle grade, but, um, and, um, the Hunger Games, um, and it's just sort of classed as young adult fiction. And I've noticed that those readers are a lot more adventurous. They don't sort of stick to a certain genre, mm -hmm. but I've definitely come across adult fiction. There are a lot of people who say, oh, I never read science fiction. But things like Kazuo Ishiguro, who wrote Never Let Me Go, which is about clones, and that won the Nobel Prize this year. I, I guess just sort of seeing the boundaries of genre and seeing people reading more widely within genre fiction, uh, I'd like to see more of that. That is so exciting to hear because I get really frustrated when people will put kind of a cat, like this, this big like separation between literary fiction and genre fiction, which I understand where that comes from, but there are so many books that absolutely fit the bill for both, you know, <laughs> it's just like, there's so many. It's, there, are, there are so many books which cross those boundaries. Yeah. I mean, Margaret Atwood. And, and the other thing that I find upsetting is that when there's a really good science fiction book, then people say, oh, well, that doesn't count. Like, um, I remember, uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember some, I, someone saying to me, oh, well, I, I don't actually, I don't think I've ever read a science fiction book. And I was like, well, uh, 1984's dystopian. And have mm -hmm. you read Frankenstein? That's basically sci-fi. And, and he was like, well, I, I've read that. And I've read First this. One, and, some people say. And after a while, I was like, those are all science fiction. He was like, no, 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 no. Science fiction is about monsters and, you know, <laughs> crazy things. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a that's type of science good. fiction. So, yeah, so I was disagreeing with him, but I, it's hard to sort of overcome like people's preconceptions about the genre, uh, which I think are wholly unfair. It's so varied. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, but that is definitely really cool to see where it's going. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today, Timmy. Um, where can people find you? So my website is um, theonlytimmyo.com. Uh, I also Instagram uh, quite a bit, um, mainly about like the writing process. So if you're interested in that, I'm on Temi underscore a zero instead of an O H. Yeah. Um, and my book comes out in spring 2019. So 
You only have a year to wait. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you have a wonderful afternoon. All right. Goodbye. That was my conversation with Timmy O. If you want to stay in touch, you can follow Females in Fantasy on Twitter at Females in, and that is the letter in, Fantasy. I wasn't actually able to get females in fantasy as in the word in because there wasn't enough space. But um, once a month, we hold a Twitter chat, as I mentioned in our conversation. Um, and we talk about uh, representation of female characters. We will cover like different, very specific topics. And it is a lot of fun. So if you're on Twitter, you should definitely come and uh, and join our conversation next time. You can also follow me on Twitter at Brianna underscore De Silva. And I talk about a lot of things on Twitter. I talk about uh, activism stuff and bisexual stuff. And I talk about writing stuff and I talk about a lot of things. So um, come and be my friend there, obviously. Um, <laughs> and because uh, I want to be famous and all that. Just kidding. Um, I want to thank Mireille Gash for creating the awesome illustration that you see as our mascot, uh, the lovely female warrior character um, that is in the logo. It was created by Mireille Gash. And if you want to support the show, there are a couple ways that you can do that. One, a huge, huge, huge help for me is if you rate and review it on iTunes. You'll hear podcasters say that all the time, but it really will help uh, this podcast to um, come up to the top of search results and things like that. And more people will, will see it and they'll know that it exists. Um, so I would really appreciate it if you could just take a quick moment and maybe leave five stars uh, <laughs> or however many stars you think I deserve um, and a quick little review. And that would really help me a lot. Another thing that you can do is you can become a co-creator at, if you visit patreon.com slash females and fantasy for a dollar a month or $5 a month, whatever you have, if you have anything free, um, you can join our exclusive book club. And um, you also have the opportunity to uh, submit questions for um, the guests on the podcast. So you get to kind of shape the show and uh, uh, you get to determine some of the things that we get to talk about. Also, just a little spoiler alert, um, the book that we are reading this month in the patron exclusive book club is written by an author that may or may not appear on the podcast very, very soon. Uh, so that'll be cool. Meanwhile, though, our next guest in a couple weeks is going to be Sarah Glenn Marsh, uh, who wrote the recently released fantasy book called Reign of the Fallen. And I'm really looking forward to sharing that conversation with you. Thank you for listening and I'll catch you next time.